Hello, my friend. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to spend a few moments with us. You know, I want you to know, I'm praying for you today. I really am. I'm praying that our time together will be life impacting and life changing, encouraging. Regardless of what you may be facing or what you're going through, I pray today your heart will be encouraged. I'm asking God to meet you at the point of your need. I'm asking him to do in you and through you and for you what you cannot do for yourself. Again, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Take your Bible, turn with me to the book of Esther chapter 5. Esther chapter 5, and we're going to read verses 1 through 5. Esther chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Follow along as we read. On the third day of the fast, Esther put on her royal robes and entered into the inner court of the palace, just across from the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne, facing the entrance. And when he saw king, Queen Esther standing there in the inner court, he welcomed her and held out the gold scepter to her. So Esther approached and touched the end of the scepter. Then the king asked her, What do you want, Queen Esther? What is your request? I will give it to you even if it is half the kingdom. And Esther replied, Well, if it please the king, let the king and Haman come today to a banquet I have prepared for the king. And the king turned to his attendants and said, Tell Haman to come quickly to a banquet as Esther has requested. So the king and Haman went to Esther's banquet. You know, for the most part, for the most part, our society lives by the motto, man controls his own destiny. They, we live by the motto that man controls his own destiny. People believe that the world's fate as well as man's fate is determined by man's actions. But I want you to know that's not true. The wisdom of this world has no measure to the wisdom of God. Listen, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 19 says, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. You know, people dismiss and even scoff at the idea that God is the one that's in control of what ultimately happens in the world. And yet the Bible clearly states that it is God who is in control of what happens in this world. Psalm 115 verse 11, uh, verse 3 says, But our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Isaiah 43 verse 13, There is no one who can deliver out of my hand. I work and who will reverse it? Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11 says, Who works all things according to the counsel of his will? Daniel chapter 4 verse 35 says, He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. Isaiah 46 and verse 10 says, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. No, the Bible clearly tells us that it's God who is in ultimate control of what happens in this world. He's not the author of the disasters and the sickness and the pain and the problems. He's not the author of that, but he's in controlling behind the scenes to bring his will to pass, his purposes to pass in the earth. You know, one of the most arrogant things people do today is they assume the role of God. They assume the role of God. For example, in the issue of abortion, they assume the role of God, who lives, who dies. I, I think of playing God with gender identity. People say, well, you can choose your den gender or you can create a gender. You realize today that people are claiming that there are over 72 genders you can choose from? Well, my friend, that's utter foolishness. Utter foolishness. God said he created two genders, male and female. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created him. That's it. You know, no one has the privilege of choosing their own gender. God made that choice when you were conceived. Look, here, here's the truth. You can put a 
dress and lipstick on a pig. But my friend, it's still a pig. You can call yourself whatever you want to call yourself, but you're either male or female, regardless of what you say you identify as. So playing God with gender identity. And then here's another one, big one. People play God with climate change. People claim that climate change is caused by man. But my friend, that's just not true. God is the one that's in control of climate. There, from Genesis to the book of Revelation, you see God's hand at work in controlling the environment, the climate of this earth. And it changes. It, it has seasons where it's hot, where it's cold, and it just it's that rhythm that goes. You look into the Old Testament and you see some dramatic climate events, but there was no uh, smog or whatever they're claiming today is that which has caused these things to happen. No, that was happening back in the beginning. In the beginning. I, I chose some verses out of the book of Job to make my point on this. Job chapter 38, verse 2, and then verse 4 through 6 says, who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? And to what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? In Job chapter 38, verse 8 through 12, it says, Or who shut the sea in with doors when it burst forth and issued from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band, when I fixed my limit for it and set bars and doors, when I said this far you may come, but no farther, and here your proud waves must stop. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place? Job 38, verse 19 and 22. Where is the dwelling of light? And darkness, where is its place? Have you entered the treasury of the snow? Or have you seen the treasury of hail? Look at uh, Job chapter 38, verse 25 through 30. Who has divided a channel for the overflowing water or a path for the thunderbolt to cause it to rain on the land where there is no one? A wilderness in which there is no man to satisfy the desolate waste and to cause spring forth the growth of tender grass. Has the rain a father? Or who has begotten the drops of dew? From whose womb comes the ice and the frost of heaven? Who gives it birth? The waters harden like a stone and the surface of the deep is frozen. And that's just a small sampling of scriptures in the Bible that talk about God being ultimately in control of what happens on this earth. We become arrogant trying to play God and claiming that we can reverse the climate issues. Oh, and I'm not saying that we can't do a better job on uh, controlling our pollution, but my friend, step back from the thing. God is the one who's ultimately in control. He's the one who sets its rhythms. You know, God controls what happens in the world. This is a biblical truth that is clearly seen in the story of Esther. Chapter 5 uh, in the story of Esther opens with Queen Esther standing in her royal robes between, uh, before the king. And the king not only welcomed Esther into his throne room, he asked for her petition. What is your request? So Esther requested that the king and Haman attend a special dinner that she had prepared in their honor. Well, that moment came, and the dinner with the king and Haman, it went well. So well that Haman left feeling really good about himself and his position. And on his way home, Haman saw Mordecai still wearing the sackcloth and ashes and still refusing to bow down before him. And when he got home, Haman vented. He told his wife and his friends how much he despised Mordecai. And his wife and friends had a simple solution. This is what they advised. Kill him. Just kill him. Bring an end to this. They suggested that, that Haman deal harshly with Mordecai and send a message to all the other dissenters at the same time. Haman liked the idea that that was pleasing to him. And he ordered the construction of gallows that measured 75 feet high. Wow. Now, Persian gallows are different 
uh, in that they do not include a rope with which to hang someone, the gallows that you and I are most familiar with. No, Persian gallows consisted of a sharpened pole that would impale the body when dropped upon it. That's what Haman wanted to do to Mordecai. He wanted to drop him on a sharpened pole, impale him, and let him die suffering in pain. Well, one night, the king is tossing and turning on his bed. He, he is not able to sleep. He's unable to sleep. And he doesn't realize at the moment that it's the God of Mordecai and Esther that's keeping him awake. So in an attempt to help himself fall asleep, he called for one of his servants to come and to bring the royal record book and to read to him from it, hoping that it would make him sleepy and that he would go to sleep. And as the servant was reading... Uh, to the king, there was one entry that caught the king's attention. This entry read, Mordecai saved the king's life by reporting an assassination attempt. So the king stopped the, the servant from reading it, and, and he asked the question, what honor has been bestowed upon Mordecai for saving the king's life? In Esther 6 and verse 3, the king's servant who attended him said, nothing has been done for him. Nothing. Well, it really troubled the king that nothing had been done for Mordecai, the one who had saved his life by reporting an assassination attempt. And he, he wanted to do something, but he wasn't sure what to do, what to do for him. So the king told his servant, go find whoever is available in, in the court to have, and have him come to me. Well, at that exact moment that the servant goes out to look for someone available, it's just before dawn, and Haman is now walking into the court. So he tells the king, the king sends for Haman. Now, both men, both men have Mordecai on their minds. The king wants to honor him. Haman, on the other hand, he wanted to kill him. So the king asked Haman, he said, what should be done for the man with whom the king wishes to honor? Well, Haman was so narcissistic, he assumed the king was talking about him. In verse 6 of chapter 6 in the book of Esther, now Haman thought in his heart, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? Now, thinking of himself and how he would like to be honored, he told the king his idea. Here's what you should do parading through the city, riding on one of the king's horses, wearing a royal robe. Everyone will bow down and pay homage to him as he passed by. Wow, the king liked that idea. He liked that idea, so he ordered Haman to carry it out. He said, go bestow this honor on Mordecai the Jew. It's recorded in Esther 6, verse 10. Then the king said to Haman, hurry. Take the robe and the horse as you have suggested and do so for Mordecai, the Jew who sits within the king's gate. Leave nothing undone of all that you have spoken. Oh, that's not what Haman was hoping. His heart sank. His plan had backfired on him. Haman intended before the sun set that day to have Mordecai impaled on the gallows. Instead, He's putting him on the king's horse. Haman had planned on leading Mordecai to the gallows with the, uh, to the sound of the jeers of the crowd. Instead, he's leading him through the streets of the capital to the cheers of the crowd. It's not what he planned. It's not what he hoped. Nothing could be more humiliating to Haman than what the king is having him do. You know, justice has a way of being served, doesn't it? After the celebration, after parading uh, Mordecai through the streets of the capital, he rushed home to tell his wife and his friends what happened. And th listen to what's said in Esther chapter 6, verse 13. Talk about prophetic. If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. Well, Haman knew he was of, of Jewish descent. That's the whole plan is to have Mordecai and all of the Jews exterminated. So here's a prophetic. You're not going to stand. If he's Jewish descent, you'll not survive this. Well, who in the world could have predicted this change of events? 
I mean, this is pretty dramatic. Who, who in the world could have predicted such a change uh, of events? I believe only God could because it was God who was working behind the scenes, orchestrating all of the details of the events that were unfolding. Think of it. A sleepless king, the detailed reading of the court records, the entry of Mordecai and his heroic deed that has gone unrewarded, uh, the entrance of Haman into the palace court at the exact moment the king is looking for someone to help. These unfolding events, my friend, they prove without a doubt that God is in control. God's the one behind the scenes orchestrating this. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11, it says, In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all all things, not some things, a few things, most things, who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Oh, don't get duped into believing that you and I have a play in what ultimately happens on the earth or happens in the story of our life. No, listen, my friend, the Bible teaches that God is the one behind the scenes orchestrating the details as they unfold before us. Think of it like this. Even in the most pagan corner of the world, and Persia certainly was, and even in the heart of the most hedonistic king. I mean, he was rotten to the core, but God was at work. Even in the interplay between two men, the king and, and Haman, who had de decreed the death of thousands of Jews, as horrible as that was, I'm telling you, God was at work. So today, my friend, regardless of what you're facing, Trust, trust what he says in his word. He is at work. God is at work behind the scenes on your behalf. You may not see his hand at work, but that doesn't mean he's not working. You may not hear his voice, but that doesn't mean that he's uh, absent and that he's not doing things on your behalf. When you feel like everyone and everything has turned against you, including God, when you feel that even God has turned against you, trust me, God is at work. You don't see it, you don't understand it, but God is at work. And, and I'm not basing that on something that, that I th I'm telling you what the Bible says about it. Now, when you feel like your good deeds that you have done have gone unnoticed and unrewarded, well, don't despair because God's at work in that. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10 says God sees everything that you've ever done to his name, and he won't forget it. A reward will be coming to you for that. It may not come at this moment. But God won't forget what you've done for his family and for his name. So remember the plight of Haman and the outcome of Mordecai. Remember those two things. God flipped their stories. Haman's day began with high hopes of getting rid of Mordecai once and for all. He was wanting to see Mordecai squirming as he died on, the, on that pole at the gallows. Mordecai's day began with him wearing sackcloth and ashes, praying in the shadow of those gallows. Haman's day ended being humiliated. Mordecai's day ended being celebrated. Understand, it's what I'm trying to say is God is in the details. God can be found working in the details. He works quietly in small moments as well as in big moments. See, with God... Things that are insignificant become, insignificant become significant because he's working behind the scenes, whether we see his hand or not. He is always at work orchestrating the day-to-day -day details of our lives. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment that God is the author of your sickness. He's not the author of your pain. He's not the author of your calamity, your crisis. your pro He's not the author of that. The Bible says he's not, but he is the one that can overrule those things as he works out the details in our lives, and he's faithful to us working behind the scenes, orchestrating that which will ultimately serve his purpose. Now, what the devil has meant for our harm, the Bible shows conclusively that God turns around for our good. I think of Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. We know that all things, not everything is good. 
I mean, that would be foolish to say that if, if cancer has come your way, that, well, that's good. No, it's not. The Bible says in this verse, it says, we know that all things work together. The sum of all things will turn out for our good. I think of uh, the story of Joseph in, in the book of Genesis. His, as a young teenage boy, his brother sold him into slavery going into Egypt. And it looked like it was going to be the end of Joseph's life. He was going to just be uh, sent into oblivion, and, and that's where he would die. But God was orchestrating something. He was putting Joseph in a place of prominence where when this famine hit Egypt, Joseph would be the one to make it uh, possible for the nations to be fed, not just the Egyptians. And the reunion with his brothers, and they, after, after their father Jacob, after he died, the brothers were afraid that now dad's gone, Joseph's going to get even with us. And Joseph calmed them down. He, he told them, don't even think that way, because in, in Genesis 50, verse uh, verse 20, listen to what it says. Joseph said to them, listen carefully, do not be afraid, for I am in the place of God. Joseph was mature enough with his relationship with God that he realized, all right, I'm in a horrible place and I'm in a horrible circumstance, but this is where God is allowing me to be for this time. And he goes on to say, but as for you, you meant evil against me. You tried to destroy my life. But God meant it for good in order to bring about, as it is this day, to save many people alive. God takes what's meant for our harm and he turns it, he flips it so that it serves his purposes and it does it for our good. You know, there's one truth that governs disciplined followers of Christ. If you discipline your heart to follow after Christ, there's one truth that's gonna govern that journey. And that truth is this, faith is a choice. Faith is a choice. When disciplined followers of Christ are forced to stand at the crossroads of doubt and at faith, because of their discipline, they will choose faith. They've learned. They've learned over their, their, their time with Christ to place one determined step in front of another as they walk out their faith and their allegiance to Christ. We live in a world of broken promises. I'm not telling you something you don't already know. You know that. Broken promises, broken vows, unfulfilled pledges. You know, often the promises that ended up getting broken they were initially made with bold and sincere confidence. I'll always love you. You can count on me till death do we part. Don't worry, I'll protect you. Sometimes those promises were made with, out of absolute sincerity, but they got broken. Those vows, those pledges, they got broken. But my friend, listen, you will never experience a broken promise from God, never. Never experience a broken promise from God. In the world of broken promises, God never breaks a promise. He never fails. Let me say that again. He never fails. Psalm uh, verse, chapter 12, verse 6 says, The Lord's promise is sure. He speaks no careless words. All that he says is pure truth. God will never break a, prom a promise to you, never break a pledge to you. You know, people in your life may fail to keep their promises and pledges to you and vows to you, but God will never fail to do so. He'll never fail to keep anything that he's promised to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20 says, For all the promises of God find their yes in him. They're yes in him. Hebrews 10, verse 23 says, Let us hold steadfastly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. He who promised is faithful. In a world of broken promises, none of them have been broken by God. Wow. Well, let me ask, does this really matter? Does God's faithfulness to keep his promises, does it really matter? Does God's integrity really make a difference? Does it matter? Well, my 
response is this, it's yes, it really does matter. For example, when you're in the midst of a crisis and you don't see any way out, trust me, his faithfulness matters. When you're facing an impossible challenge and you run out of option, his faithfulness matters. When you need a miracle for yourself or for one of your loved ones, his faithfulness matters. When your grief is so great and your heart is so broken and the night seems so long, trust me, his promises, his faithfulness, they matter. When you're pacing the halls of a hospital waiting for the news of your loved one, his faithfulness matters in moments like that. When your marriage is falling apart, his faithfulness matters. When your kids are in trouble and making bad decisions, his faithfulness matters. When you're standing uh, by the bedside of a dying loved one, trust me, his faithfulness matters in that moment. When you stand at the graveside of the love of your life and then you have to go home alone, his faithfulness matters. In the good times and in the hard times, the good times, hard times, bad times, difficult times, God's faithfulness to keep his promises matter. They matter. So my friend, whatever you're going through, turn to God first and ask for his help. He's right there. He's waiting to hear your request. Claim the promises of God that pertain to your circumstance. And when everything and everyone around you tells you to panic, don't listen. Don't listen to them. Instead, listen for God to speak to you through his promises and then put the full weight of your trust in him. Always remember, you can trust God because he never fails to keep his promise. Psalm 31 verse 5 says, You have rescued me, O God, who keeps his promises. My friend, listen, if you're going to assume anything, assume that God is at work in the details on your behalf. And when you can't see God's hand at work, it's okay. It's okay because he's still working on your behalf. When you can't make sense of his ways, don't be troubled. It's okay. Trust him. He knows what he's doing. And then do what you know to do. I mean, do the right things. Do what the scriptures instruct you to do. And then be patient when you don't know what to do. Isaiah 40, verse 31 says, But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. Oh, my friend, listen. God is at work behind the scenes in your life. He's found in the details. He's orchestrating all of the details. You may not understand it. You may not see it. You may not even like it. But you can trust him. He's never broken a promise to anyone, and he's not going to begin with you. He loves you, and he's faithful to you, and his faithfulness matters. Let me pray for you. My Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I bring my friends with me. Father, I thank you for your faithfulness. It really does matter. I thank you for being faithful to me in my dark times, my problems. You've always been faithful to me. You've never failed. You've never broken a promise to me. There have been many times I didn't understand what you're doing. I certainly didn't like what you were allowing, but you were faithful to me, and I'm grateful. Lord, I ask you to be that to, for my friends today. Some of them are in crisis moments right now, but God, turn their heart to see that you are at work whether they see you or not. You're there whether they hear you or not. God, meet them at the point of their need. Show your faithfulness to them in all things. Some of my friends, Father, that are with us today, they're not living as they should. They're not where they need to be with you, and they know it. God, I pray today will be the day they'll hear your voice, and they'll sense your love, and they'll come back to you in a right relationship. Some of my friends, my Father, they've never met you. Oh, they've heard about you. They've known things about you, but they've never encountered you personally. They've never confessed their sin. They've never asked to be forgiven. They've never offered you their heart and their life. I pray today will be that day. Draw them. Draw them to you. And then finally, Father, some of my friends that are with us today, 
they're, they're in pain, they're hurting, they're sick. They need a miracle. I believe in miracles. I've seen you perform too many of them to doubt you. So I'm asking on behalf of my friend that even this very moment in the name of Jesus, your healing grace will move over their body and heal them. Oh, I thank you for the time we've had together. I ask you to be at the point of uh, need for my friends. Do in them and through them and for them what they cannot do for themselves. And I thank you for this. And I offer you my prayer in the name that's above every name known to the ear of a man, the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you, my friend. Thank you for listening to this week's message. To stay up to date, please like us on Facebook at Touching Africa Ministries or visit our website at touchingafricaministries.org. If you would like to give online, head to touchingafricaministries.org slash donate.